Hey you guys, this is Jessica and Noam. We're here at Rex Tracks in Chicago for another episode of What's That Sound? Today we are exploring the drum sounds of Echoes by Pink Floyd. The drummer was Nick Mason. The engineers were John Leckie and Peter Bown. It is super hi-fi. It's really psychedelic. There's reverse reverb. We're gonna figure it all out. For our drums today, we used a Ludwig Vista-like kick drum, our trusty 70s Gretsch toms, and a Ludwig Acrylite snare drum. Uh, we heavily muffled our drums for this sound, so we have a sleeping bag in our kick drum, and we put cloth on our toms, and we used a big fat snare drum drum tortilla on our snare. For our cymbals, we used 14-inch K-suite hi-hats, an 18-inch K-Suite uh, crash cymbal, and for our ride cymbal, we used a 21-inch A-Suite ride. So capturing the Pink Floyd drum sound, we have to pay attention to the things that we know about it from listening to the record. We can hear that the snare drum sound is really, really wide. We can hear that the toms are even wider, and that gives us some hints as to how they're placing those mics. We can also hear that the drum sound is really, really bright, but it's also really smooth, right? And that gives us some other hints as to how to pick which microphones we're gonna use. So for the width, we went really wide. And for the height, we went about six feet. If we wanted more room sound, we could have gone a little higher. If we wanted it to be a little tighter sound, we could have gone a little lower, um, but six feet was just the right balance for us today. So for the overhead mics, because they were so smooth, we took a guess that they were probably using ribbon mics. We used Cole's 4038s. Now those are really, really dark microphones naturally, um, but they take EQ incredibly well. They take EQ in a way that like no condenser microphone is gonna take that much EQ that gracefully. So you can crank 10K into these microphones and they kind of sound like condensers at that point, but with a smoother top end. So it, it lets us add more high end than we normally would be able to and get this really hi-fi sound that still kind of feels 70s and smooth. So for the kick drum, we used an Electro Voice RE20. It's a really classic 70s kick drum sound. We filtered off some low end because we knew that we didn't want like a ton of sub in this, in this thing. The, the Pink Floyd usually has the sub stuff coming from the bass and the kick is kind of voiced just above it. So we're filtering everything above about 50 Hertz. Um, we're doing that with our SSL EQ. And then we made sure to control the length by taking the front head off and sticking baffling inside of the drum. That is the best way at the time. They weren't doing a ton of gating, things like that. So we had to control the length of the drum in the room. That gave us a really well-rounded kick drum sound. So for the snare drum, we ended up using a U87. Now this is a super dangerous microphone to stick on a snare drum. It's super expensive. If you don't trust your drummer, they are gonna break it. However, we trust Jessica with this mic and we also uh, knew that she was gonna be playing really, really lightly. So we were able to stick it really close. Uh, you have to make sure that you put a 10 dB pad on that because otherwise it's gonna blow up. Um, but it can sound really, really fantastic on snare. For the toms, it has a kind of like drier, dynamic microphone sound. I'm guessing they were using something like D19s on it. For today, we were just using our Sennheiser 421s.
So as far as processing, we didn't use any compression on this stuff. Past the EQ, the only dynamic control we were using was saturation. Now we recorded this into Pro Tools, so we weren't using actual tape, but I put a plugin called Satin and I put it on every single channel and it is just compressing everything, but not through compression compression, it is tape saturation compression. So it's really just catching the biggest peaks, right? The, the times where she would lean in really heavy, it would kind of flatten out those, those transients. It's super important in this case because she is playing super light and the dynamic range could be massive, right? And if you have massive dynamic range, it causes all kinds of problems with your compression on the whole overall track, with your limiting, with your mastering, all kinds of problems. So we knew that we had to limit the dynamic range, but we didn't want the sound of compression. Tape is a perfect answer for that. So we've got the clean basic drum sound together. Let's listen to that before we do any of the extra special effects. So the next thing we have to figure out is the reverse reverb. This is over on the left side. They have it mono and they have it panned to the left so you can kind of hear what effect we're, we're listening for if you go back and listen to this track. The way they would do this back in the day is they would take either the full drum kit or they would take a couple microphones and they would record them onto a separate reel of tape. And that reel of tape, they would flip it over and rewind it so that it could play in reverse. Now they would take the reverse signal and run that through a reverb and record that reverb onto a track and then flip that tape again and play that, right? So now what you have is you have the, the actual drum sound, which has been reversed and then reversed back. So it's been double reversed. It's, it's going in the correct direction now. And you have reverb, which has only been reversed once. So that reverb now happens before the actual hits of the drum. Every time the hi-hat is hitting, you get this little psh, this little uh, tail that is before the hi-hat, not after it. And if you do that for the entire kit, you can get these really interesting rhythmic things uh, based on how long the reverb is going for. This effect can be used for anything. It's not just for drums. It sounds great on vocals. It sounds really cool on guitars. It sounds really good on keyboards. Uh, Jimi Hendrix was doing it. The Beatles were doing it. A bunch of people were experimenting with this stuff in the, in the 60s and 70s. The reverse sound in this song was really high endy. It didn't sound like it had a lot of kick. It did not sound like it had a lot of snare. So what we did is we took the overheads and we filtered everything below like 800 Hertz and ran that to the reverb so that it was just high end that was getting reversed. So today we decided to record into Pro Tools. So we're not doing it on tape, um, but Pro Tools has a reverse option. So let's listen to the drums first reversed. And now we're gonna reverse it again. And so we have just reverb that is in reverse. Here's the reverb alone. So you're asking, why is this not easier? This seems like a lot of steps, it seems complicated. There absolutely is easier ways to do it nowadays. Uh, if you are in Pro Tools, you can pull up reverbs in the audio suites and press the reverse button. It will do exactly this. There's also other ways to do it in different DAWs as well. So we got all our elements together. We hard pan the reverb to the left because that's what they did. Uh, this effect sounds really, really cool in stereo. They probably honestly didn't have enough tracks at the time to do it in stereo, uh, but you can try it out in stereo as well. Let's take a listen to the whole thing.
That was the drum sound for Pink Floyd Echoes. As always, please let us know in the comments what other songs you'd like to see us break down. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>